Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Dark Power, where we cover everything that happens on AEW Dark, Elevation, and NWA Power. Thank you once again for joining me. Guys, remember to hit that like button, comment, share, subscribe. We are over a 1,000 subscribers, but we are continuing to try to keep pushing those numbers up. It allows us to do what we do for you guys, which, as always, is just friends talking about wrestling. So let's get into it. This week's episodes have short and sweet. Short and sweet for actually all three. Uh, all of them had a under... Well, I mean, NWA Power always has a one-hour runtime, but this week's episode of NWA Power actually was about 45 minutes long, and then Dark and Elevation both ran short. So let's get straight into it and get covering it. On Elevation, there were a couple things that stood out. The first was actually the Lee Johnson versus David Ali match. I thought this was a really nice opener, and... Uh, I, what I liked, I think, about it was that we're seeing more of Lee Johnson, and he now has his own unique theme music, he has his own shirt, he's getting his look. They're really acclimating him to what it means to be a singles guy in AEW. We still have that Nightmare Family collect, a connection. He is still part of a faction. There is that relation there. But he's able to now... We're not seeing him with... With Dustin, obviously we're not going to see him with QT, but, but we're seeing more of who he is and what it means to be Lee Johnson. Great to see him starting to get more of an identity. I liked the Danny Limelight showcase a lot. The showcases are always very well done, very well made. You get to learn a lot about the guys, and we're talking like talking about character work with Lee Johnson. You get to develop that. This is a great way for people who don't know that much about Danny Limelight to learn a lot about him. Yes, they're able to talk about a few things here and there on commentary, like the fact that he was a Marine. That was definitely covered previously through commentary, but seeing him be able to talk just directly with the big show is a really great touch and i like it a lot and all the showcases have been well done this one also is well done and we know that we're going to be getting him in the main event against john moxley i don't think he's going to be doing too well against john but we'll we'll see what happens there the match right after this was Thunder Rosa versus Renee Michelle. That was a good match, keeping Rosa moving. We're going to be seeing Rosa show up multiple times here on this evening as we know that she works with NWA. That's her home promotion. I liked the Eddie Kingston promo talking about how he's going to target the Young Bucks after everything that's been going on with him, Moxley, and the Bucks, and Kenny. Uh, I do think now we are definitely going to be getting the Moxley Kingston versus the Bucks for the tag titles at double or nothing. I it's it's really unfortunate because I wish that the SCU storyline had had more time to be built up. They they're doing a lot of promo for it on Twitter, on BTE, on Instagram and all and YouTube and all that kind of stuff, but I wish the story had been able to be a little bit more played out as opposed to just SCU has an eliminator match, even though they're ranked number one, and then they confront the Bucks after the Bucks have a match. I wish there had been a little bit more to it than that. They could have told a little bit better of a story, particularly since we know that SCU is not winning on Wednesday. But I just, I don't know. If, if they're going to go out, I think they could have could have been given a little bit better of a showcase. But hey, that's... Wrestling, that's how wrestling works. Sometimes you have to move angles a little bit more quickly than you intended to. I liked the Jurassic Express versus Chaos Project match. That one was a good one. And our main event, which was Moxley versus Limelight, that match was really well done. It was a standout main event. And, you know, it's, it's something that we kind of, I guess, maybe expect because it's John Moxley, but Moxley is a really good talent, and Danny Limelight is a really good talent, and that's going to be a match that I want to see more of down the road, especially as we get to know more about Danny Limelight. We see him going after more singles wins, more championships, all that kind of stuff, and I hope that he's somebody that they can use to bridge the gap between New Japan Strong and AEW. That'll be really cool to see. But let's turn towards Dark itself. Dark, there were fewer matches that stood out to me. Here we have more of... We're starting to see now the, the differentiation between Dark and Elevation. Elevation really is having longer, storm, longer form matches, and Elevation is having more storylines within the show as well as connected to Dynamite. Dark is more about just getting 
dark matches, just getting in-ring time that people need to have to be able to progress and develop. And dark seems to be about being able to stack wins so that we are keeping track of our win-loss record and making sure that people's title aspirations are justified. And speaking of whether people's title aspirations are justified, we have Lance Archer picking up a really strong win over Age of Fashion. We have Jake the Snake on commentary, and it's always great to have Jake on commentary. He has a very unique way of putting things, <laughs> and a unique way with words. Jake, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts has always been considered one of the better promo workers in the business. Not the greatest wrestler, but great on the mic. And we talk about great wrestlers and people who are developing. That's kind of the purpose behind Dark and Elevation. And we can see that with the Varsity Blondes with against Jalen Brandon, Trayvon Jordan. This was a short match, fun match. I liked uh, what I like about it a lot is you see that we see that people like Darby, Sammy, MJF, and uh, who's the third person? I forget. A oh, fourth person, Jungle Boy are kind of the youth movement when it comes to the single sides of things. Well, if that if they are the youth movement and the future stars of tomorrow, when, or today, I mean, realistically, when it comes to the single side of things, I think Varsity Blondes fits that role for the tag team division, particularly with the history behind Brian Pillman Jr., his father, his family. If you didn't get a chance to watch The Dark Side of the Ring, Definitely watch that. It's very informative. And uh, check out our review of it, too. I was on there with Sid and Chrissy, and that was a really great documentary review. I had a lot of fun doing that. But you learned a lot about Pillman's background, and I think that they are going to be making him and Griff Garrison some people to watch in the future for their tag division and their building behind them. And we also talk, when we also talk about about the single stars, like there's that tier, that four person tier of Sammy, Max, Jungle Boy, and Darby. And I think right below it is where Preston Vance 10 fits in. And he has a really great match here on Dark against JD Drake. We're seeing kind of the Dark Order have two separate feuds going on. They have the feud against the Hardy family office, which we get referenced on Elevation with a Reynolds match and then the Hardy family attacking him afterwards, and we get it referenced here on Dark, but they also are having a feud against, I still don't know what exactly their name is, I keep calling them the Fashion Group, I don't know what else to, what else to call them, but the Fashion Group, and here we see it in the form of 10 versus JD Drake, good match here, one of the, one of two longer matches that we get back to back on Dark, and right after this is a tag match between the acclaimed Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela. And if the Varsity Blondes are the future of the tag team division, then the Acclaimed are going to be their foils. The Acclaimed are natural heels, Varsity Blondes are natural faces. And I think they are going to be people who, these four, these two teams, these four people are going to be developed over the years and they are going to be the cornerstones of the AEW tag team division down the road. We're still going to have our, our you know, PNPs. We're still going to have our, our private parties, our Bucks, FTR, etc. But these two teams, they are going to be, I think maybe, I think maybe two, three years. Like, I'm, I'm giving them a long runway. But I think, I think that they are going to be the people that AEW is going to be building behind. The Acclaim just have a great look. Great character work, great gimmick. It's it's a, it's, it's a claim worthy. <laughs> I guess that's the, the best way to put it. And finally, one of the last matches that stood out to me in Dark or on Dark was Brian Cage taking on Bear Bronson. That was a really good match. Two good hoss fights. Uh, two good hosses going out in a fight. I just I need I need to see where they're going with Brian Cage. I want to know what exactly is happening. We had that hiccup kind of in the road where it seemed as though he was going to leave Team Taz. It didn't, it didn't materialize into anything. We know that Ricky Starks has an injury. He's going to be out for a while. And maybe that's why they're cooling it, that storyline, because there's really nobody for Cage to feud with. I mean, I guess there's Hobbs, but, I mean, Hobbs isn't really worthy enough to be somebody to go after Cage yet, especially due to just experience levels. Like, Cage is a great guy, and if he, they turn him face, I mean, you're losing out a big thing when it comes to him versus Ricky Starks, if Starks isn't there 
to face off against him. So hopefully, hopefully we see more of Cage as a heel. If they're not going to be able to have him turn face, or that's not the plan, then I want to see him go on a bigger run as a heel. And let's try to make that FTW Championship mean something. Let's let's have FTW Championship matches on Elevation. That'd be a great place for it. Particularly since we know that there's no, it's not a sanctioned championship, and the guys and the girl, the guy, not girls, but the, but the guys in the back, why should they want to face off against Cage and take it from him? Well, if Cage is having matches and he's putting it on the line, then there builds up a prestige to the championship, and there's more reason to try to take it from Cage. And granted, it's not something that. A heel would do right a heel is trying to hold on to a title usually by sneaky underhand means but cage is designed to be a powerhouse heel he's designed to be a brock lesnar kind of heel so let him do that let him be that let's have some ftw championship matches on elevation it's a great hook for elevation you start building up the titles prestige and then if Ricky Starks, well, you know, when, when Ricky Starks heals up and gets back, then you can restart that potential Brian Cage leaving Team Taz situation. Maybe you tell the story that over time he realized that he can be an honorable person and maintain and still maintain the championship, right? Because he's just so powerful and just so dominant. Then he starts to butt heads with Taz for whatever reason. And let's not forget, we still have Christian lying around there in the background, just. I don't know if they're if they're if they're slow burning that storyline again because of everything that happened with Ricky or what exactly the case may be, but I'd like to see some Cage versus Christian a uh, action. That'd be really good. And I think the other thing to think about is that Cage beat Hangman, so he has to be moving up those rankings. Hang Adam was the number one contender, so let's see what happens with that. So let's turn now to NWA Power. <laughs> and it's interesting because I'm just going to say it. This show was a mess. <laughs> this show was an absolute mess. And I guess the problem here is that they just, they have a lack of people. They have a lack of people when it comes to who they can really use. And <clears throat> this, this episode is going to get thrown all out of whack because of it. So, let's start at the beginning. The beginning of the episode, Aldis is there with Strictly Business. He kind of shits on the Battle Royale idea. He's upset that he even had to find out from Joe Galley that this Battle Royale is going to be happening, aka a way for Trevor Murdoch to get a title shot. But, fine, whatever. Here's the problem. <laughs> It's a great promo. It's actually a really great promo. The problem is that he says that he, after finding talking to Galley last week during Power Surge, he found out that current champions cannot enter the Battle Royale. Okay. So far, I'm following you. So, Pope can't enter the match because he's the TV champion. Fine. So, naturally... Aldis wants to hold off on the tag title match that's supposed to happen in the main event because if Latimer and Adonis win, they are unable to be in the Battle Royale, so they can't influence the outcome. Still, still with you. Still with you. Here's the problem. Adonis is already the national ch champion. So he's out of the match anyway. So it's only Latimer that can enter the match, and only Latimer that can influence the match, but Nick is acting as though all that, that Adonis would be able to get into the match as well. So he's not being consistent with what he himself is saying. That's a problem. But, you know, whatever. It's, I, and, it, and it's not a problem of consistency of the heel lying about things or being wrong about things. Like So, for example, if the face wins or whatever the case may be the heel says the face did something wrong or his shoulder was underneath the rope or like he's able to like in a sense lie about how he lost there's still ways to get heat back but in this situation nick is just stating a fact the fact is that champions cannot enter the battle royale adonis is already excluded 
But I guess maybe he's saying, all right, I don't want Latimer to, to at least need one person. But then why include Adonis when he says both of these men are going to be entering the Battle Royale? I don't know. That's a bit of a miss for me. Besides that, great segment, good keeping things going. But as soon as the segment ends, they the promo is uh, right afterwards they do the... National Wrestling Alliance, and they're like, uh, look forward to what's going to happen in the future, and it's this damn tag title match. So are we having a tag title match or not? Because in other situations, when we have found out that we're not going to have the match, they immediately scrub it and say, this is what we're going to have instead as the main event. Okay, whatever. So now we have a match between Matt Cross and Mims. Pretty solid match for, I think it was under three minutes. And uh, here we see Matt Cross getting ragdolled for the majority of the match, and he's able to pull out a bit of a underdog kind of win. Cool, whatever, nothing too crazy to write home about. It happened. Let's get, I mean, if, from what I understand, it's supposed to be a qualifier for a TV title shot, so if he is now getting a TV title shot, let's get him versus Pope and see what happens. Next, we have Tyrus and Austin Idol coming out for a promo. Ugh. This is already a little bit rough. And Pope comes out. They call him out. And Idol, I guess, apparently is trying to extend the, an olive branch or a hand of friendship. Pope doesn't trust it, as he should not. And nothing crazy here. I think if we do get Pope versus Matt Cross, Tyrus interferes to keep the storyline going. Whatever. Nothing too crazy. Here's where we take a turn again. Because the next match is Saul Renaro comes out and says that he... He has to be a man, and he has to stand up for himself. And he is challenging J.R. Kratos to a match where he says he wants everybody banned from ringside. Okay, cool. Kratos answers the challenge. Abs if the ragdolling that Matt Cross got at the hands of Mims was not enough for you, the ragdolling that Saul Renaro gets at the hands of Kratos is absolutely crazy. He just straight out... I, it was technically a pin. He he's standing with he. So at one point in time, he's standing and he's got he's holding Renaro by the legs, but Renaro's inverted, so his back his shoulders are actually on the mat, but he's holding him by his legs and he just deadlift Germans him, and it's incredible just because of the amount of power that it takes. That's an actual he's actually lifting him. There was no way for Saul Renaro to help him in any way, shape, or form with that suplex. So, I mean, impressive stuff from that regard. But we're now running into a problem because Kratos is one half of our tag team champions. And we know that we're supposed to be potentially getting a tag title match in the main event, provided that, I guess, Strictly Business decides they do want the title match. And we're still getting promo for that title match. So why is Kratos answering this challenge? It doesn't make sense. Anyway... We get a, a kind of interview segment with Mae Valentine and Aaron Stevens. And Aaron basically says that he believes that he and Kratos can still be partners. And he wants them to, be, to try to do this in an honorable way. He knows that he hired Kratos as a mercenary because he needed a tag partner. But he wants to believe that he and Kratos can work these problems out. Okay, cool. But again... Kratos, I mean, uh, Stevens is in regular clothes, so is he not preparing for this main event? And if he isn't preparing for this main event, why do they keep promoing it? I don't know. Next, we have a segment that didn't really help anybody, but had a confusing end result. So we have Rosa, Thunder Rosa, and Melina, Taryn Terrell, and Camille. I'm already upset about this because why is Taryn Terrell there and Melina doesn't really help out too much. But then they start talking and Camille, while she is, I'm not like, I'm not that upset about it because I know Camille's getting better, but you can see how far she needs to go. She's so easily distracted by an audience that the NWA controls. The NWA is controlling this audience and can easily tell them, shut up and let her talk. Like, don't do the interruption thing. And 
normally you wouldn't need to, but you do because Camille is getting distracted, and they can see that. So, also, this isn't live. Just cut, say cut, give this audience some instruction, say action, let Camille do what she's got to do. But no, they let it go, and she allows herself to be distracted by the crowd, and then on top of that, Rosa and Melina are in character, and they are interrupting her, you know, doing whatever they need to do, or should be doing, and she can't get a hold of what she's supposed to be saying because she's allowing herself to be distracted to the point that even at some points when she's trying to land punchlines, like she's trying to land the strong parts of this back and forth, she can't do it because she'll start talking, Rosa and Molina say some shit, and she just stops. And it's like, wait a minute, no, you can't... She's trying to, like at one point she's trying to say that Rosa needs to tell everybody that she's a badass and, you know, go around the world and compete in different promotions, you know, AEW, etc. Whereas all Camille has to do to show people that she's a badass, and then she stops because somebody else is talking. No, like, you gotta land, make sure you land that hit. Because when you're talking and you start saying something, a lot of times people can tell where you're going. They can tell where the, where, where, what you're trying to say. And if you're not able to land the full shot in that exact moment, you don't get the same result always. You don't get the same impact of what you're trying to say. So I think that they need to work with her a little bit more on that. But besides that, the segment just went too long to get to what they were trying to get to, which was basically saying that they're going to have another match. Camille's number one contendership's on the line. And if... Rosa loses, which Camille says when Rosa loses, Rosa will not be able to compete anywhere else but the NWA. Now this part is interesting. It's a little confusing, but I kind of like the twist on the tail. Normally you'd have a situation where, particularly the heel, says, if you lose, you're gone. Like a loser leaves town match, something like that. And Rosa's going to get kicked out of the NWA. But here we're seeing a situation where Rosa has to stay in the NWA. Well, why would we do that? Camille has a very interesting argument. Camille says, after you lose to me, you won't be able to go anywhere else and you won't be able to get other championships, but you'll be forced to be here watching me be very, very good at what I do and taking the NWA Women's Championship from Serena Deeb. And we know that I'll have beaten you two times now and you won't get that championship back. It's a very interesting twist on the tale. I kind of like it about that. So, I'm interested to see the match. These two are, well, I mean, one is one of the best women's wrestlers on the planet right now, and the other one is developing still, but can, can work to a pretty good rate and can get a pretty good match. And Rosa can get an awesome match out of Camille, as we saw at the back for the Attack pay-per-view. So, I'm looking forward to seeing how exactly that happens and whether or not this is going to be a power match or if it will be a pay-per-view match for that When the Shadow Falls. A part of me really wants to be a pay-per-view match, like just let us have the build, particularly since the pay-per-view is June 6th, it's already the second week of May, we can, we can make this match for the pay-per-view. Finally, in the last match, as we will later find out, we have Jax Dane taking on our very own Chris, Chris G, and it's him versus Slice Boogie, False Count Anywhere match. This was actually a pretty good match, eight minutes or so, and nice action here and there. They do use the false count anywhere stipulation to their advantage, doing a lot of fighting on the outside. There's a suplex onto the floor, and I gotta say, those floors, no pads or anything like that, so that actually hurt. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of that act, uh, in, out of the ring stuff. I want to say in-ring action, but it's outside of the ring. The finish of the match comes when Crimson shows up with a white towel to, to potentially throw in the towel for his partner, Jack Stane. Now, here's the only thing that's a little weird about this. Slice Boogie is hitting Jack Stane with a chair, and if I remember right, false count anywhere does not mean no disqualification. It just means no count out, like, because false count anywhere. That doesn't, like, you can't, you can use the chair in the sense of you could suplex somebody into the chair, slam somebody into the chair, but you can't actually just hit them with it. That's would still you're still using the foreign object 
in incorrect or illegal means. So I feel like that should have been a disqualification. But anyway, he's bashing up on Jax Dane. Crimson comes out, and Slice Boogie makes a very good point. He says, you can throw in the towel for your partner. Everything that happens now is your fault because you have the ability to stop this. Got a valid point. So they get back into the ring. He's got the chair. He puts the chair onto Jax's head. Uh, he's gonna. It looked as though he was going to drop kick. He was. Uh, Jax is in the corner with the chair on his head. It looked as though Slice was gonna run, hit a drop kick, and you know, basically kill the guy. But Crimson jumps up on the apron. J uh, Slice Boogie turns around. They get into a little bit of a jaw jacking back and forth. And Jax is able to get the chair off of his head. He runs to hit Slice Boogie from behind. Slice steps slightly out of the way and collides with Crimson, knocks Crimson off. Jax gets out of the ring to check on Crimson and in the process takes the towel and throws it. And the ref's like, wait, what the hell? And Jax says, no, I'm, I'm giving up. I care more about making sure that my partner is okay. So honorable, very honorable man uh, to, to do that. And a great way for Slice Boogie to get a win without really pinning the guy, which kind of protects a potential future match between the two of them, which I liked. That part was really cool. That was a well done little trick. Later, right after this, we find out that Strictly Business has left the building, so we're not gonna have the tag title match. And that's how the show ends. I think if they knew that they didn't want to do that, they should have changed how the show went. They shouldn't have done the promo. They shouldn't have had Kratos have that match against Saul Renaro because that makes zero sense. Because let's assume for a moment that the tag title match did happen. You are putting yourself in a match against Saul Renaro where you can potentially get hurt, lose, get tired, winded, whatever the case may be, and you then lose the titles. The titles are more important. So... Yes, I guess it's a little bit of confidence. You're not going to lose to Saul Renaro, but still at the same time, be a thinking man's heel. And I wouldn't have had Aaron Stevens do a plain clothes interview. That just was a little weird. Either way, we got a three match show, nothing too crazy, moved storylines along, kept things building for different matches. Hopefully, we see a shot of Trevor Murdoch at home, resting, recuperating from. All of his various injuries that you pick up while you are wrestling as he sits out this 30-day suspension. But we'll see what happens with that. So, guys, this was our coverage of Dark Elevation and NWA Power. Remember to hit that like button, comment, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Thank you guys for tuning in. Catch me on Fusion of Honor with my co-host three-time, 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 baby-making champ Ness. Until next time, guys, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I'll catch you later.